All right, let me start by taking attendance. This is CISS 232, scripting in the client server environment. At least I hope it is, because that's what I'm ready to talk about today. <clears throat> you will notice that, um, or maybe you won't notice uh, initially, but I am recording the lectures in here. Uh, the quality of the videos recorded in here aren't necessarily the best, but if you miss class or if you want to review something, at least it provides you the opportunity to do it to some level. Um, one thing that I will do in addition to um, posting the videos is I'll post to Angel any code examples I have. I've heard people say like it's hard to read on the screen the code and I can totally understand that but I do up also upload the code examples so you can have the file right with you as you're, as you're watching through the uh, recording. All right. Daniel Coates. Here. I'm going to I'm going to try this. Brittany Sukasi. Su uh, Susai. Susai. Okay. Scott Flournoy. Michael Gugat, Jonathan Lewis, Nicole, and David, of course. Why would I think that you'd be here at 9 o'clock when the class started? I'm just messing with you. All right. What I want to do today is I want to go over um, the, the basics of the class and, and then sort of present the overview of the class. Like if you go to a musical, sometimes they have the overture, you know, where they play little snippets of all the songs that are going to be played in it. And that's kind of what I'm going to do. Um, and in fact, I'm even going to sing that part of the lecture to continue the musical theme. I'm just joking about that. I'm not going to sing anything. I did once, I, I used the app Songify to, to, to uh, turn my lecture into a song. Once. And you're welcome to do that with the recordings of these. Uh, I would invite uh, invite you to do that. But at any rate, let's let's start off by going over the logistics. If I'm not mistaken, I've had all of you in one class or another. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So if you if you've been in any of my classes, you sort of have a sense of how I play the angel. So it'll be pretty similar to that. Um, I have a getting started, read this first. You don't really need to do that because I'm, I'm going to introduce you to it. That was a leftover um, from when this class was taught online. All right, so in fact, we, let's, do, let's delete that to avoid any confusion. Syllabus, we're going to spend a few minutes going over that in a minute. Copyright information for educational projects. You've probably seen this before. This is just there as a reminder to you that if you use things, especially things such as images from websites, to give credit where you got the images from. And I would also suggest if you took the images, to put a note on there saying I, images are copyright me or something like that, just so I make sure that I realize that you didn't, weren't using someone else. This lays out the details of the law. And again, it's not as though, um, you know, it, it, it's stringent restrictions. But there are different copyright laws for education. There are more flexible copyright laws. So you can use things in an educational context that you would not be able to if you were creating your own website, either for a commercial thing or even something non-commercial. Um, there'll be a folder for each week. In that folder, I'll post the video for the lectures. And I'll post any examples, and the assignments will be posted there. And then finally, there is a discussion forum. All right. Let's look and see if there's anything in the week folder that I forgot. Nope. Lab 1 instructions and the Dropbox. And the 
lecture videos will appear in there eventually. On to the syllabus. My suggestion when we had meetings this past week, like the week before classes started, was that every member of the audience should be given a little mini cowbell. And anytime the presenter reads from what's being displayed on the screen, people in the audience should be allowed to ring their cowbell. So I try not to do that because that's probably the one of the things that I hate more than anything else is when people read this. So I'm not going to read the syllabus. It's, it's your responsibility to read the syllabus. I am going to comment on it and sort of focus on the parts that I think are most important. The top part of this is important. It shows, a, shows among other things, ways that you can get a hold of me. I try to make myself as available as humanly possible without giving my home address out or anything like that. You can access me by email, either through Angel or through my regular campus email address, mzellers at lauriencc.edu. I do have a phone, but I would urge you, it's probably better to email me than to phone me because I check my email more often than I check my phone messages. So if you absolutely were stuck somewhere and you're going to miss a class or you had something important and you didn't have access to email, hypothetically, you could call the phone number, but you're better off emailing me. Now, this class has a lab session associated with it. So do all my other lab sessions. So do all, all my other classes have lab sessions. And you're invited to sit in on any of those lab sessions as well. And I will invite people from other classes to sit in on our lab session as well. The idea is, for the most part, in lab, I'm just sitting around waiting for people to ask questions. And therefore, if no one has questions, I'm just sitting there. Well. What I do is I invite people from other classes to come in. That way if they have some special, um, if they need some special assistance or help and they're not getting uh, enough attention in the lab session, they can come in and ask me questions during that. So I'll post a list of lab times and you can come to any of those. I have uh, Monday through Thursday, I have a day class and an evening class. So hopefully one of those will meet your schedule. In addition to those, I'll publish soon a list of office hours. If none of those things work, you can make other arrangements. We can talk via the phone. We can Skype. It's something that I especially like to do. Um, I, I started doing that, l let's see, last spring semester when I was actually injured and out for half of a year, half of the semester. Um, I uh, use Skype to conduct my classes, and I use Skype for people to discuss questions with me. And it's nice because I can actually see your screen, um, and, and you know you can show me the exact error that you're getting, and I can view the code that you're running, and we don't have to play email tag with that. So I would encourage you to do that as an option as well. The point is, is, is I try to give as many opportunities as possible to contact me if you have questions. So if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. I mean, look around. This is a pretty small class, all right? There is six people in here. I think there's one person who isn't here today. Um, and so therefore, you constitute approximately 14% of the class. You yourself. So if you're confused about something, that's 14% of the class is confused. All right. In addition to that, keep in mind one of the oldest teacher adages that there are is that if one person's confused about something, there's a good chance that other people are confused. So now we're up to 28 or even 42% of the class if two or three are having questions with it. So please don't hesitate to ask questions in class. If that doesn't work for you, um, ask in lab or make arrangements via these other means. 
here's a list of sort of the outcomes and it's sort of important to review these and keep these in the back of your mind because this is why we're here. This is the stuff, these are the concepts and the techniques that we want to master in this class. Textbook, instructor approach. At first line, if you can indulge me without ringing your hypothetical cowbells, this is your class, all right? Um, I'm only here to help you understand the material. It's not as though there's, you know, th that I'm here to just talk for my health or whatever, all right? This is your class. And we bring responsibilities to this class, and my responsibilities are to create assignments, to create lectures, to create activities. But, and your assignments are to do the reading, to work on the assignments, and so on. Um, a big one of your responsibilities is to, as I pointed out before, to ask if you have any questions. I will use ANGEL a lot in this class, like, so I won't ever hand anything out. Um, so like the syllabus, you can view the, the syllabus on ANGEL, and if you want to print out a copy, you can do it. If not, you can just you can save some paper and, and just view it online. Here's a whole bunch of campus policies. Instructor policies, um, I'm very flexible as far as late work is, is, all right? But my caution to you is not to use that as a crutch, all right? If you are late on an assignment because you're not feeling well and you just couldn't work on the assignment, that's one thing if you miss one assignment or a little bit late on one assignment. If you're habitually late, if you're late on every single assignment, it's going to snowball and you're going to get further and further behind and it's going to be tough catching up. So late on one assignment or two assignments because of some special circumstances, okay. All right. That's not that big of a deal. However, if you are late continually, that's a sign that we have to address the situation somehow. Maybe there's something you just un uh, don't understand. Maybe you hit a roadblock that's really keeping you from moving forward. Fair enough, then we can work through it. Or maybe you can look and say, well, gee, I need to devote more time to this. Whatever. There can be any number of reasons why you're getting stuck, and that's our job to work together to figure, figure out what you need to do. All right. There will be three tests and a bunch of homework, and that will be your grade. We'll talk in a minute about sort of the main topics of this class. There's essentially three main sections of it, and there'll be a test or quiz, depending on how you score it. They're not some massive things about each of the three main areas. In addition, there'll be homework, and the homework will be anywhere from one to two week sort of thing. Some of them may even be a little bit longer and I'll weight the points accordingly. Um, it should come out to be approximately 60 points. If it's not 60 points, I'll prorate it. So if we only get 56 points worth of homework, I'll multiply your score times 60 over 56 and that will prorate it up to be worth 60 points. Um, Here's the uh, grades, pretty standard. Here is the schedule. This is subject to change, the schedule. Um, again, a nice thing about a class like this, especially the size that it is, is that um, I, you know I have a degree of flexibility and I can sort of adapt it based on how things are going in class. I have a much better idea where everyone's at in a smaller class so I can adjust this. So this is sort of for planning ahead what the schedule is, um, but again, you know, the class will be flexible. One other thing I'd like to mention is that, in my opinion, the textbook and my lectures 
are not are not meant to coincide exactly, if that makes sense. In other words, what's the point of me lecturing exactly what's in the book? All right. Look at it this way. This is giving you, you're getting two different takes on the topics. You're getting the, the, the topics as covered in the book. You're getting the topics as covered by me. So ideally, getting both of those together is better than getting just one or just the other. All right. So, again, I, I have some people say things along the lines of, you know, you don't stick to the book and all that. And it's like, well, you, that's true, you know, but I kind of do that on purpose. And that's, that's sort of the reasoning behind it. All right. Any questions at this point? All right. And I assume you're Jonathan. Yeah. All right. of deduction was demonstrated there. Amazing, huh? All right. I'm going to draw a diagram that I will draw a million times in this class. And if you have me in other classes, I'll draw it probably a million times in those classes as well. And it's a diagram that indicates the way that a client and server interact. All right, sort of how that little interaction works. All right, let's define a couple of terms here. And these terms might, I'm going to divide, define these terms in a way that might be a little bit different than how you've heard them defined before. Not to say what you've heard them defined more uh, in the past is, is wrong, but this is sort of my perspective on it. What do I mean when I say a client and a server? The name of this course is scripting in the client-server environment. What is a client? What is a server? Check my microphone here to make sure it was on. What is a client? What is a server? What is your understanding of what a client or a server is? A client is a user. A client is a user. All right. Anyone else have anything to add on this? The server hosts. Software. Server hosts. Anyone want to add to that? So, uh, server stores databases. Server can store databases. All right. So good definitions, good descriptions of a client server. I'm going to frame it maybe in a more general way. A client makes requests. A server responds to requests. All right. Specifically in this class, we're focused on web servers. But there's other kinds of servers as well. There's database servers, there's file servers, there's any number of different servers. There's DNS servers. So there's all kinds of servers. But what they have in common is that they respond to requests. Just like clients, there's all different kinds of clients that you can have. All right? A desktop machine can be a client. A phone can be a client. A bot that is for a search engine that is crawling the web to index web pages like Google is a client because it's making requests from a web to a web server and the web server is responding back. All right. So the client is a user. 
user. It is the, again, sort of depending on the context, either we mean like the person is a client or the machine is a client, all right, depending on whether we're talking sort of as an uh, overview or uh, on a more technical level. And the server is where the web pages live somewhere out on the internet. Now, the internet itself is drawn as a cloud, and I, I, I'm not claiming that I coined the phrase, but I was drawing the internet as a cloud long before people were talking about cloud computing, all right? And the reason that is drawn as a cloud is we don't care what happens inside of there. It sort of gets fuzzy in there. I'm not saying it's magic or anything. I'm just saying in this class, we don't care. We trust somehow, all right, that when the client, when I type in www.cnn.com, that that request somehow makes it to CNN server. And when CNN server is delivering the web pages, it somehow makes it back to us. You know, if you want to know the details of that, take another class, you know, take a networking class or something. All right, we don't really care about that part of it. All right, it isn't a direct connection though. That's sort of what the cloud implies is it doesn't go straight, you know, my machine isn't wired to CNN server. My machine is wired to the internet and uh, so is CNN server and somehow my request makes it from here to there. Now, in the most simple scenario, we have completed web pages here, like maybe the web pages you did in CISS 216, the Intro to Web Development. All right, completed web pages. By completed web pages, I mean pages that contain HTML, CSS, maybe JavaScript, and maybe some other stuff, images or whatever. These are called static pages. Maybe a better word than completed is static. What do I mean when I say that a web page is static? It's always the same. It's always the same. It doesn't change. It doesn't change unless someone manually goes in and changes it. So if my web page, if you were to open up a web page that you did for CISS 216, it would look the same today as it did the day that you turned it in. All right? Why? Because those are static pages. All right? The code is set and it doesn't change. Now, in the case of static web pages, the web server's job is easy. The web server simply takes and finds the files that the user requests for. So if I request a particular page from a particular web server, the server simply finds those files and sends them down the line. And the analogy I give, I give a lot of food analogies. The analogy I give is like going to a McDonald's and ordering a Big Mac. Alright, if you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac, they're not making that Big Mac special for you. All right, that Big Mac is sitting in a bin, is already there, and the server in McDonald's, you make the request for a Big Mac, the server responds to you by going in, grabbing a pre-made Big Mac, and handing it to you. Pretty simple, all right, in that case. So with static web pages, the idea is the same. Client makes a request, all the server does is find the files associated with that request and sends them back to the client. Clients, typically we're talking about web browsers being used by the client. Web browsers understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. All right. 
Now, some web browsers know other things as well. They can handle Flash and other stuff like that. But the focus in this class is going to be on sort of what are called web standard technologies. And these would be HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So, in a simple case of static web pages, the client makes a request through the internet, the server finds those files, sends them back through the internet, now the browser has stuff that it understands. It has HTML code, it has CSS code, and it has JavaScript code potentially. Some mix of those three things. And then the browser can display the page and can go on from there to the next request. All right. That's a case of static pages. Static pages, however, really aren't what we know the internet to be these days. All right. For example, in Angel, all right, when you log in and when I log in, the page changes. The page looks different. Your Angel homepage, after you log in, looks different than my Angel homepage. How is that possible? Has someone crafted an HTML page for every single person on campus? No. There's a process that gets executed that, on the fly, creates the web page according to certain sort of specifications. So what we have on the server end, in these cases, these are called dynamic pages. <coughs> Is that we don't have a completed web page, but we have a script. Think of a script as sort of a recipe, all right, to create a web page. Now, these scripts can be written in any number of languages. They can be written in ASP.NET, C Sharp, PHP, Python, Ruby, Perl, and any number of different platforms. But regardless of the specific platform, these scripts serve the same role. And that is taking a user request and some other ingredients and creating a web page custom for that request. The food analogy here would be going to a subway. All right? You go to a subway. Do they have a bin with every possible combination of sandwiches that you could order at Subway? Of course not. That would be ridiculous. What do they have? They have a server all right, that can follow a recipe and can follow a certain set of instructions to make a sandwich customized to your needs. So you go in and you order a turkey club. All right, They ask you what kind of bread. You say you want wheat bread, okay? They use wheat bread. They ask you, you know, what vegetables do you want on it? What kind of cheese? Do you want it toasted or not? And do you want any dressing on it? So they ask you all these questions, and then when you're done, guess what? The server gives you a sandwich, just like the server at McDonald's does. So in both cases... Whether you're talking about dynamic pages or static pages, what gets delivered to the client is the same thing. That is HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Just like when you go to a Subway versus a McDonald's, the process is different, but the end result is the same. You get handed a sandwich. All right? That's important to recognize because you can't eat a recipe. Right? If you went in the Subway and they gave you the recipe for a turkey club can't do anything with it, right? That recipe has to be brought to life. That recipe has to be executed, all right? And the end result of a sandwich has to be produced. 
Same idea here. These scripts need to be executed by the server to create the end result. Yes? Is any of the scripts like, more popular than the other ones? Um, the most popular formats would probably be ASP.NET and PHP. I don't have any statistics on it off the top of my head, I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure you could probably find some if you did some research, but I would suggest that those are the two most popular. Uh, in a nutshell, you know, you have the Microsoft environment and you have the everyone else environment. All right? And oftentimes, if you're using Microsoft Web Server, you will use ASP.NET because that goes with that. In another environment, in the, in the Linux slash Apache slash whatever uh, environment, um, you'll see PHP very, being very popular. In this class, we're going to cover PHP. Other classes here on campus study ASP.NET. So we thought we'd at least have one non-Microsoft technology in here. All right. So, in Subway, the ingredients for making a sandwich are laid out right in front of the server. So the ingredients are the cheese, the vegetables, the meats, the dressings, and so on. What are the ingredients that go into the script for dynamic web pages? Where do the ingredients come from? In other words, I log in Angel, you log in Angel, it gives me a different home page than it gives you. What are the ingredients? The, your input. All right. So one of the key ingredients to this would be user input, which in HTML documents is typically entered in through a form. What's the form that provides the user input to the angel script? The login, right. You give a couple ingredients to that script. You say, I want to see the angel homepage. Well, the angel homepage for who? All right. Each person's homepage on angel is going to look different depending on who they are. So, the ingredients, how it knows what to display, depends on the user input. You type in your username and password, you get your page. I type in mine, I get my page. All right, someone types in an incorrect password, they still get a response, right? And that response says, hey, you're, that's not a valid password combination. You go and try to execute a page that doesn't exist in Angel. You type in a URL. The server still responds saying, I don't know what page that is, so I can't display it. So the server responds. The response isn't always you know, what you might want, but the server always responds to your request. What other ingredients sort of come into the recipe for making a web page? Permissions, in a way, yeah. Yes. Browsers. Browsers, how so? The way they read that information that comes back to them. That is important. All right. However, that, well, uh, let me clarify my answer. Browsers, that is important, but if you talk about the way that the browser processes the information that came back to it, that's after the server has done their job. However, a browser can be important. A browser can be an ingredient in that. Have you ever noticed if you are, let's say you're on a machine and you go to download a piece of software. If you're on a Mac, you may see a different link than if you were on a Windows-based machine. All right. In other words, the server knows the platform that you're on. And the server can do things based on your platform, can do different things. This becomes even more dramatic if you're talking, if you're talking about mobile versus a desktop machine or mobile versus a full-fledged computer. 
if you go, if you type in your browser, CNN.com, on a desktop browser versus on your phone, you're going to see two wildly different things. So, part of the request that gets sent to the server from the client are the form input, like the user ID and password. Another part of it is, for lack of a better word, the environment. In other words, the platform, the browser, etc., and so on. So, I didn't want to say immediately, no, the browser doesn't come into play, but I wanted to clarify, yes, this is when the browser does come into play. What's another ingredient that might come into play? We had it up on the board a while ago till I erased it. It rhymes with theta place. Database. Database. Right. Database can be an ingredient. In other words, if I log in, all I supply is my username and password, right? But I don't supply a list of all the classes that I'm enrolled in. I just supply my username and password. Well, where does the rest of that information come from? Like what my name is, what classes I'm enrolled in, what my permissions are. You know, am I a student in this class or am I an instructor? I'm actually taking a class this semester. And if you go to my angel page, it will show that in the classes I teach, I'm an instructor. In the class that I'm taking, I'm a student. Well, that kind of comes in handy, right? So I can't grade my own work in the class in which I'm a student. What class are you taking? I'm taking a music appreciation class. So, you can see. Yeah, maybe. Shows down here. Instructor, 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 student. All right, so I go into this class. Look, I can go and grade. I can go take attendance and all that. I go into this class. Oops. <coughs> yeah, there's nothing posted at all, right. But I definitely can't grade or go and add assignments or whatever. I had a feeling this professor would be kind of old school and and because we got paper syllabuses syllabi whatever you call them yesterday so in other words let's follow the progression of how this would work if I'm not logged into angel at all and I go to angels homepage I first request through the internet, Angel's logon page. They send it back and it has an HTML form on it. I put in my username and password and click submit. That information goes along with the request for the Angel homepage to the web server. On the server, there is a script that takes a look at my username and password and looks it up in the database and says, is that a valid username and password combination? Yes or no. If it is not a valid username password combination, it sends a response that says, hey, this isn't a valid username password combination. So that's the one kind of response. The second response is if it looks it up and it finds that that is a valid, the script continues to pull up a list of all the classes that I'm in, 
from the database, formats that as a nice little HTML column on my homepage, and sends back that web page to the client. So again, there's instructions, there's a recipe on the server side that's going to take as input my user ID and password and then follow a procedure. Is it in the database? Yes or no? If no, send back to the client an error message. If yes, then continue with these steps of looking up the courses, looking up what role the student has in those courses, and so on. All right? The bottom line, though, is that when the server is done doing all its magic, it is going to produce HTML, CSS, JavaScript, because that's what browsers get. That's what browsers understand. And a browser needs to be delivered that to be able to understand it. All right? Now, I do want to, I don't want to muddy the water too much with this, but I do want to add that while in some cases the web server and the database server are the same machine, in other cases there's a separate web server, especially if you're talking about like a larger project. In that case, the web server wouldn't also house the database, but the web server would communicate with the database server. In other words, it's the web server, but it's a client of the database server. All right? That's why sometimes people say, a machine's a server. A machine is only a server within a particular context. Or it's a web server, right? That means it responds to requests for web pages. It's a database server. That means it responds to database requests. A machine isn't always a server, all right? It would be like someone, a server at McDonald's. They go on their lunch break and they go to Subway, all right? They're no longer the server. They're the client of Subway. And they go in and ask for their sandwich in the same way that other clients do. So in this case, the web server would be a client of the database server. All right. So this is probably a more complete drawing. But for simplicity's sake, in some cases, the web server and database server are like the same machine. So in some cases, it, it serves both roles. The equivalent of that, I, uh, I, I guess I shouldn't think of restaurant equivalents for everything. But I guess the equivalent of that would be if one person took your order for your sandwich and another person took the order for your beverage. All right. In that case... You know, um, the one server is a sandwich server, the other person is a beverage server. Dynamic web pages is really what the web is about today. In other words, you'd be hard pressed to find a major website that consisted of static pages. All right? Static pages would be used maybe for smaller websites like maybe a restaurant, right? A restaurant, not much about a restaurant changes, right? They have certain hours. They have a certain address. They have a certain menu. And those things may change, but it's not like they change like every day, all right? In other words, if the restaurant's open, you know, Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, the weekends, 9 to 9, that's probably the hours that it's going to be for a, a period of time. And if that changes, it will change once in a while. And someone can go in and manually change the website to reflect those changes. You can't apply the same mentality to something like, for example, eBay. How often do, does the stuff, does the information that you find on eBay change? Constantly. People are always adding items. 
People are always making bids on items. The time on an auction counts down. You simply can't conceive of something like eBay done in a static mode, right? It, it just is inconceivable. You need scripts, you need programs that can process those requests. If someone wants to make a bid, the program looks to see if the bid's higher than the previous bid. If it is, then it changes the leading bid. If not, it rejects it or whatever it does. All right? You couldn't think of Facebook as being done with static pages, right? Because Facebook, people are continually posting stuff. People are continually commenting and liking and sharing and all the things like that. Virtually any major website, when you think of the web, is going to be largely dynamic pages. All right? So, in a nutshell, in this environment, the job of the server is to prepare a web page for the client. In the case of static pages, the page has already been prepared. It just has to deliver it. In the case of dynamic web pages, the web server goes through a process by which the page gets prepared and sent to the server. Yes? What about wikis? Wikis would definitely be a dynamic page because anyone could edit it. Anytime you think of being able to change something where a user can change it and not a programmer or a web developer can change it, that's going to be a dynamic site. Because in other words, the request that the client sends, if you pull up a wiki, if I, pull, if I go and make a Wikipedia entry for me or update one, all right, what I'm doing is I'm filling out a form in my browser. I'm clicking submit. That's sending the information through the internet. And in this case, the, the, the server isn't going to be inquiring the database. The server is going to be updating the database to take the information I entered and create a new entry in the wiki for whatever it is you create. Same thing with if you, if you were to edit a page. All right? So the script takes that and follows a process. So anytime you think of a process that has to be performed to get the job done, you're talking about dynamic. And in the case of a wiki, that's definitely a case of a dynamic. All right? Next time, which is next week, on Monday, we will talk about two things, and then we'll get into um, JavaScript in more detail. Monday we'll talk about the role of the client, and specifically the role of the client scripting, which is JavaScript. We'll also talk about Ajax. All right? Your first assignment is to go and create a plain old web page nothing tricky or fancy, about three topics, I think. Let me look. I don't remember what the assignment is. I think it was only two. Two? But you should have two sources and two resources, like two resources right. and two resources. That's no fair reading the stuff that you're supposed to. No, I'm just kidding. There is three. JavaScript, PHP, and Ajax. And then for each of these topics, two references and two sources. These are really the three technologies that we'll be using. So that is the assignment. All right, questions? All right, we'll see you in lab. Um, I... If this class room is available, I need to experiment with something for my later in the day class. So if you have a question for me in lab, hit me up right after I open the door. Otherwise, I'm going to come in here for come back in here for a couple minutes. In addition, I'll come back here to get um, the file so I can post them.